I think these concepts are best understood with examples. So we're going to go through just a couple examples here. So uh, we have a hypothetical population of Sasquatches or Bigfoots. So obviously this is a made up example. If we had 10 Sasquatches, our population would be 10 or N would be 10. If next year we had 11 Sasquatches, we went from 10 to 11, then that represents a 10% difference. So the rate of change is 10% per year. So given a 10% rate of change, our R would be 1.1 in this situation. And T is one year. Since we're talking about 10 Sasquatches one year, next year 11 Sasquatches. So T equals one year. So if we're going from 10 to 11, that is a growth rate or R of 1.1. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, then, then pause this for a moment and make sure that you understand this concept before moving on. Okay, the rate of change can go two different directions. It can increase, it can also decrease. So here's an example with a decreasing population that the Sasquatch obviously isn't as happy about. So if we had 100 Sasquatches and they composed our population, our N would be 100. Now, if a year later, if we go from 100 Sasquatches to 90 Sasquatches, then we had a 10% rate of change. So it actually decreased. So it'd be negative 10%. So if we had a negative 10% uh, rate of change, our R would now be 0.9. So if we took 100, multiplied it by 0.9, we would have 90 Sasquatches. So <clears throat> if we have a decrease in population, that R is going to be less than one if we have an increasing population it's going to be above one if it's stable it's going to be one and again we're talking about a difference between one year and the next so t the time frame here is one year once we have all of these terms figured out and described we can create some mathematical models that are a little more complicated that allow us to estimate what the population would be after a certain amount of time given a uh, observed growth rate. So here um, is what that, that looks like. I don't want you to get hung up too much on this other than knowing that there are some mathematical ways to describe this. We could calculate a predicted population size if we know the starting population size and we know the growth rate and we know the amount of time that's passed. We can use those three pieces of information to estimate a population size at any point in the future. Uh, so an example here, if we had our class population with 50 students, um, in year zero, we have 50 students. One year later, um, if we have a growth rate of 1.1, we would just take 50 times 1.1 and that gives us 55 students. Now for our second year, we would take 55, multiply that again by 1.1, and that'd give us 60.5. And you could do that on and on to, to estimate what the population would be at any point in time. You're able to do this in a stepwise method where you could just um, carry this out step by step, or you could calculate it instantaneously using this, this formula here. Um, I don't want you to worry too much about the formula. Just know that there's ways to do this. When a population grows at a constant rate over a long period of time, this is what we call exponential growth, um, or it has a, a geometric type of growth. This um, theoretically makes sense. In practice, it rarely happens. So an example is if we took our example of students and we had a 10% growth rate in the student population each year, if that continued for 50 years at the same rate, we can end up with uh, like 5,000 students in class in 50 years. This um, happens with like finances. Um, hopefully your retirement accounts grow like this and your investments grow like this. And in real animal populations, this rarely happens. Um, there's something 
Um, they might grow at this rate for a while, but then something kicks in that helps to, to regulate that growth and keep it from growing at such a high rate for an extended period of time. Another example of this would be, um, we use the term geometric sometimes to um, the same way that we use exponential. This is a population that's growing at a set rate over a, um, over a long period of time at a constant rate. So cockroaches would be an example of this. If, we, if cockroaches produce 10 offspring for each adult cockroach um, for every three months, then you can have two cockroaches that three months later um, produces 20 cockroaches. Those 20 cockroaches three months later produce 200 cockroaches. Those three months later produce 2,000 cockroaches. So over time, those two cockroaches can produce a population of 20,000 cockroaches in, a, in one year's time. So a couple of things to point out here, um, the rate of increase is really, really high. So it's R is 10, not 1.1, like we were talking about earlier, but really, really high um, rate of growth. And T, time, is three months. So in our other examples, we we're talking about a year as our point of time. Here, it's just a few months. Uh, some populations, particularly insect populations, do grow at these exponential or geometric rates for a while, but obviously this can't happen forever. Um, there's a lot of cockroaches out there, but if this population growth happened forever, uh, at some point the entire surface of the planet would be covered with cockroaches, and we know that's not true, so something must be happening that helps to restrict population growth at some point. So we could use some of the formulas that we talked about earlier to calculate the uh, population at different set of points in time. So at three months, six months, nine months, a year. There are also ways to calculate that, um, what we call continuously. So if we looked at four months and 4.5 months and five, five months down the road, we're able to calculate those also using some of these uh, mathematical formulas. Don't worry too much about the mathematical formulas. Just know that we, we are able to calculate those at a, a continuous rate as opposed to um, just these um, periodic points through time. And this is a formula where we're able to do that. So exponential growth or geometric growth always has its limits. Populations can grow um, at a constant rate for a while. But at some point, something happens, and that keeps populations from continuing to grow. So under real-world situations, there are limits that restrict how high a population can grow. So on a very simple example, we took a couple fish in a fishbowl. And if they produced um, exponentially, even if it was just a 10% change each year, at some point, there'd be so many fish in there that there's just not enough space for them anymore. So space becomes a limiting factor, as well as food and um, oxygen and, and water and shelter and all, all sorts of things can be limiting factors that keep that population from just growing at a continuous rate forever. Um, this restricts and reduces the population size and keeps it from growing continuously forever. So we're going to talk about a few more terms here today. Um, one of them is carrying capacity. So in, in a fishbowl, there's some sort of carrying capacity. There's a, a enough resources in there for a certain amount of fish that can sustain those fish for a long period of time. Um, carrying capacity is a population that can be support, supported in a specific area without depleting all the resources available to them. Um, in this example here, this image from your textbook is a moose. And uh, a moose population, um, whether it's a uh, forest or tundra or whatever, at some point there's a, a limit of how many moose can fit on that landscape before the moose actually deplete the resources and um, restrict the ability of, of other moose to live there. That limit is carrying capacity. Now to complicate that, um, we use the the abbreviation K for carrying capacity, which I know doesn't match up, and I'm not quite sure why we do that, but um, carrying capacity is often denoted as K, and that is that sort of long-term potential or threshold 
at which um, you can maintain animals or maintain a population without depleting all the resources available to them. Along that line, if we were to continue our example of moose, um, below a carrying capacity where there's lots of resources available, a population starts to grow very quickly because there's a lot of resources available. So the population grows quickly and then it can overshoot the carrying capacity um, because of that quick population growth. So once it gets above carrying capacity, we call that an overshoot where there's more animals than the habitat can carry in the long term. Um, this is realistically what happens in most populations is they start below a carrying capacity, they have a, a large rate of growth, they get really, um, that growth rate is really high, they overshoot the carrying capacity, and then they ultimately come back down. The overshoot would be when they exceed the carrying capacity, and it's at this point where resources become limited, whether that's food or shelter or quality habitat. Um, resources become limited and that causes deaths and causes the population to fall back. Um, that fallback would be what we call a die-off. So when a population starts below carrying capacity and grows fast and overshoots carrying capacity, it can't stay above carrying capacity because there's not enough resources. So the population will crash. There's a rapid dieback, the population crashes and typically it crashes back below carrying capacity. And when it drops below carrying capacity, then um, there's becomes a lot of resources available again, and that causes the population to grow quickly and it overshoots carrying capacity again. So realistically, what we see happen in most situations are uh, populations are falling above and below carrying capacity constantly, sort of oscillating around these things where um, they have high rates of population growth, then there's die-offs, high rates of population growth and die-offs. Um, this is what we see in most animal um, and, and living populations. In my field of wildlife management, this is an area where we put a lot of focus is trying to, um, to mitigate these oscillations. So um, through like hunting and trapping seasons and things, we try to um, keep animals from from way overshooting that carrying capacity, which also slows those diebacks and keeps them bouncing around carrying capacity, but not quite so volatile. Um, that's what we're shooting for often in the field of wildlife management. In real situations, we have what we call boom and bust. So we have booms when animals are below carrying capacity, there's a lot of resources available a bust when they overshoot carrying capacity and resources become limited. So they're constantly going through a boom and a bust. So that has a, a lot of implications. You know, if you're trying to count animal populations, knowing whether you're in a boom or a bust can be important. Another area where this starts to get a little complicated is carrying capacity often changes. So take, for example, what we're going through right now, we had a, a really harsh winter for these couple of weeks. The carrying capacity during this harsh winter is different than it is during milder winters. So carrying capacity one year may be less than it is a following year just because of some of these other abiotic factors that can be going on as well. So resource scarcity slows exponential growth. We often see animals experiencing exponential growth for a little while, but eventually it slows down and we have these die-offs. And that's where I'm going to leave us at today. We'll pick up again on Friday here, um, talking about logistic growth, which is a little bit different than exponential growth. Uh, I, I do encourage you to take a look at your textbook. Um, so that'll help emphasize some of these points. Take a look at that homework assignment because I deal specifically with this. And then the lab assignment that I assigned uh, today or on Tuesday as well. Take a look at that because that's dealing with these concepts as well. Um, we'll pick up with logistic growth on Friday. At this point, I'm not sure if we're going to have class in person on Friday or remotely on Friday. Uh, it's really hard for me to predict that. So uh, again, I really appreciate your flexibility here. This isn't ideal for me either, um, as you can imagine. So I appreciate your flexibility. I appreciate your, your prayers as well for, for my situation too. I'll see you on Friday. Have, uh, have an enjoyable couple of days and be safe out there.